wiki page summaries. You know, wiki pages are pretty long. If you're trying to browse the topic or something, it's you know it's a lot of work. So it'd be kind of cool to grab a whole bunch of pages that you know relate to some topic you're interested in, and then produce some kind of summary that you could read, like one page summary. Um, the other thing you do is just kind of do something along the lines of a uh, wolf from al alpha, wolf from alpha. You know, just where you can basically ask questions and get answers. You know, something a little bit more sophisticated than just indexing pages like what Google does. Um, and finally, the, the real ultimate goal of this, um, which I don't know, hopefully will be a, a year or two from now, is to actually, I have this vision of developing a new class of browsers called knowledge browsers. And what these would be right now, if you want to find something on the web, you, you Google it, right? And what do you do? You get like 20,000 hits. You assume that the first 20 is what you're looking for, but you really don't know, right? I mean, has anybody ever looked at the 20,000th page to see if you know, what they were looking for was there? So I'd like to, what's that? You can't get there. Right, you can't. Uh, the oh, is it? I didn't know that, okay. Um, <clears throat> so wouldn't it be cool if we had a computer program that could actually follow all those hits, read what's in there, and then actually come back and say, this is what you're looking for. You know, and obviously it would have to have a little bit of knowledge about you, or you'd have to have some way of specifying the context in which you're doing your search. That's one thing that bothers me the most with um, uh, browsers, is I have no way of um, specifying the context of what I'm looking for. Um, let me give you an example. Um, I, uh, um, I was looking for, for an example of bad Lisp programming techniques one day. So I googled bad Lisp, and what did I get? All these hits on speech impediments. <laughs> right? <laughs> then I googled good Lisp. What do I get? All these like programming techniques and things, right? So I concluded that there's no such thing as a good speech impediment, and there's no such thing as a bad Lisp programming technique. <laughs> okay, um, so let's move on here. Okay, so here's an overview of what I'm going to present. There's basically three portions to my talk. One is like this crash course in knowledge representation and natural language processing. Um, then I'm actually going to look at some existing um, algorithms from a few different fields just to show you what's out there and give a little bit of context. Um, I'm also going to present some algorithms that, that I invented um, and I'm not claiming ownership to them because I probably just reinvented somebody else's algorithm that I'm not um, you know, aware of. I, I tend to do that a lot. Um, and then I'm actually going to describe um, uh, <coughs> um, pieces of the system because it's not a whole functioning system yet. But I'll show you various pieces of it and show you some what I consider some very impressive initial results. Um, all right, so, okay, so here are the AI technologies that I'm going to be talking about. <coughs> I'm going to start off by talking about knowledge representation and um, what people in the field of AI have done, have used to, to do that. I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of NLP. And, and there's, I mean, keep in mind that any one of these slides, um, you know, you could write a whole book on, and people have. So, you know, it's going to be a very high view of it, but hopefully there'll be enough buzzwords that, you know, if something interests you, you'll know, you know, what to Google for. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, one area of machine learning techniques, uh, specifically clustering algorithms. Um, and then I brought in a piece that I, um, I'm also going to talk about sim similarity metrics. And this is not something from AI technology. This is really something from intelligent web applications. And I don't know that anybody in AI is actually doing this. Um, wh one thing that's really bothered me about AI, I've been doing AI since 1983, is that um, people work in all sorts of different fields and they don't talk to each other, you know, and it's kind of like if you really wanted to build like an intelligent robot, I mean, you know, it's like the visual system has to talk to the speech system, to the text understanding system, to the knowledge system, it has to be integrated. And, and, it, and things have actually gotten worse in that each of the individual fields have gotten even more specialized. In fact, um, Niels Nielsen, who's one of the founders of, uh, of AI, along with John McCarthy, gave a really great talk at Ishkai in 2003 addressing this, this actual problem. You know, in the, when people were doing research in AI in the 70s, they really were looking at the big picture. And as time evolved, everybody got specialized and specialized until they're working in these tiny little, highly specialized domains, really like out of context of the big picture. So, so part of this project is an attempt to kind of pull things together from various fields. So, okay. The, the one field I haven't tackled yet, um, and I need to talk to my friend Bob about that, is uh, computer vision. Um, because we do a lot of stuff with text, but we also use images incredibly. Um, and there's a, a very strong correlation between the two in terms of human intelligence and what we do with all that. So, uh, okay. okay, so, <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk a little bit about knowledge representation. Knowledge representation in AI is basically based on mathematical logic. 
And the most common form of logic, the kind of form of logic that you guys are all familiar with is called monotonic logic. It's basically what you learn in, in school. Um, there have been there are limitations to monotonic logic and efforts were made um, <clears throat> mostly in the 80s to kind of address those issues and a whole bunch of specialized logics were, were developed. One of the most famous ones is non-monotonic logic, uh, also known as non-monotonic reasoning. And I'll give you a very simple example of that, right? If I ask everybody here, can birds fly, you're going to say yes, right? Then if I ask you, can penguins fly, you're going to say no. But then if I ask you, are birds penguins, or penguins birds, you're going to say yes. And you can see the problem with that logic, right? So non-monotonic logic basically provides a way of specifying exceptions um, to handle specifically those kind of issues. You know, kind of like, it's kind of like saying, for all x, except x, except certain x, you know. <clears throat> Sorted logics are basically based on this notion of type variables, where you can actually, you know, very much like in programming language, you basically specify that the range of a variable. So you can talk about x restricted to being a mammal or something, and, and, and then for all x, such that x is a mammal, you know. Um, fuzzy logic is based on this idea of, rather than having uh, yes and no value, truth and false value, you can actually have a, a whole range of, of values. It can be continuous. Um, that was also very famous in the 80s and cameras, I think, were the first ones to really make use of uh, fuzzy logic and, and there was a big buzzword and all their uh, you know, marketing stuff. Nobody knew what it was, but it was like, yeah, I have a camera with fuzzy logic. You know? um, the other thing about the standard logic that we use is that it doesn't really let you make statements about statements. Um, which are known as meta statements, and you really need something called uh, second order logic in order to do that. So, um, and in English we do it all the time. I mean, we, we make meta statements. Like if I say, you know, for example, I know that you believed that I wasn't going to show up tonight, then that's actually a meta meta statement. I'm making a statement about a statement that you made about a statement. You know, um, two forms of higher order. So there's second order logic, which just is kind of this um, allows basically predicates and clauses to be arguments. In first order logic, you, uh, predicates can't be arguments. Um, two particular types of higher order logics are modal logics um, to express things like may, can, must, and intentional logics. Um, a lot of work was done on belief spaces and you know, we all have different belief spaces so communication between agents you know, has to address those issues and intentional logics address those things. Finally, um, Another type of logic is time. A lot of what we do is temporally qualified. And it places a lot of, if you're doing problem solving, whatever, you have to do things based on temporal constraints. And <clears throat> temporal logics were developed in the 80s and there were two basic uh, schools of thought. One was kind of like this point-based um, temporal logic where you have moments in time. And that turned out to be kind of tedious if you're dealing with things. Because a lot of times, you know, we want, we want to talk about time in terms of uh, duration. And so people, um, specifically uh, James Allen came up with something called interval time logic. Um, uh, James Allen was actually my undergraduate advisor at the University of Rochester. So I actually spent a lot of time with uh, uh, do, uh, doing ITL um, uh, interval time logic. And the idea behind interval time logic is if you consider two intervals, there's 13 different ways you can arrange them with respect to each other. And those are basically the relationships before, meets, starts, finishes, overlaps, contains, then the inverses of those, and then equals. And if, if you don't believe me, you can play with it with a little piece of paper and, and try it out. <laughs> um, and then uh, one thing I realized uh, a decade later is that there's really nothing temporal about that. Um, those intervals could really be along any dimension. It doesn't have to be time. You know, that actually works. Uh, it's just a basic property of intervals. Um, in math, they use logic. In AI, they use something called clausal form logic. And that's basically Lisp, okay? So basically, predicate arguments. And everything is, is represented that way. So for example, in, um, in causal form logic, if you wanted to say, you know, for all x, parent x implies, I mean, ancestor x implies parent x, you know, you'd write it um, like this. Um, ancestor x is implied by parent x. x ancestor xy is implied by parent xy. Um, and um, you can, uh, capture the recursive nature of the ancestor relationship by saying that ancestor XY is also implied by parent XZ and ancestor ZX. And one thing to note here is that in first order logic, you're all familiar with for all X there exists Y or there exists Y for all X, right? 
X and Y are actually universally quantified here, where Z is actually an existential variable. You're basically saying that X is the ancestor of Y if there exists a Z such that parent X Z and ancestor Z, Z Y. How do you know, how do you know which is X, existential and which one's universal? Um, because Z doesn't actually appear on the um, left hand side. side. Thank you. Yeah. What was the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> good point. The question was how do you know that Z is an, is an existential variable? And the answer is that it doesn't actually appear on the left-hand side. Okay, it's basically introduced here um, to, uh, you know, to, um, to deduce the, the left-hand side. Um, we're going to see more of this on the next, on the next slide. Okay. So, so could, would it also true that anything that's unbound is, is or no? What do you mean by unbound? Yeah, Z, Z is not actually bound. In fact, Z, this is only true if there exists such a Z. We don't know that yet. I mean, it depends when you actually try to prove it, you know, like ancestor Bob, Sue, or something. You know, maybe Bob isn't Sue's ancestor. You don't know. Um, this is saying that if Bob's, you know, in order for that to be true, there has to exist a Z. And you'll notice that this defines basically, this is actually a program to compute the ancestor relationship. And by the nature of its recursiveness, it handles any level of ancestors, right? This is basically prolog. This is what prolog looks like. And this is how you write programs in prolog. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about causal form logic. The simplest form of causal form logic is something called propositional calculus. And it's basically, um, everything's fully grounded, there's no variables, um, so everything is a fact. It's basically a database of facts in, in clause form, in, in lisp form. Um, so for example, bro brother John Jill, or parent Jane Jill is implied by mother Jane Jill. Now you can imagine that if you're trying to capture the fact that if you're somebody's mother, then you're necessarily the parent. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to spell that out for every instance of, uh, of your mother predicates. There's no way of saying parent Jane uh, X, parent Jane X implies mother, I mean mother Jane X implies parent Jane X. So basically the, um, the next level of logic is first order predicate calculus and it basically introduces the notion of variables. So that now you can make statements like, you know, elephant X implies has tusks, has tusks X. Um, and as we just mentioned, there's two types of variables. There are universally qualified variables. And in mathematics, you write that as for all x. And there's existentially qualified variables. Um, you know, there exists an x. I spent so much time trying to find symbols for all and there exists. And I just could not find it. And I went through all the little symbol sets and stuff. And I couldn't find the backward e and the upside down a. So, um, I wanted to, there's actually... A lot of times people write things in logic and you have to convert them to calculus, to, to first order predicate calculus. And there's actually a well established algorithm for doing that. Um, there's about eight or twelve steps to it. You know, one of them involves bringing the not operator all the way in and, and things like that. But I want to mention one uh, particular step which involves getting rid of all existential quantifiers and universal quantifiers. And the reason I want to mention that is because it's based on a theorem called Skolem's theorem. And Skolem's theorem is something that Lispers know about, but they don't know that they know about it. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, because a Skolem constant is really just a call to Jensen. What a Skolem constant is, is basically a placeholder saying, I know this thing exists, I'm going to give it a unique name, because I don't want it to get mixed up with anything else. And, and until I know exactly what it is, I'm just going to call it you know, some unique identifier. So. And then there's something called Skolem functions, and I'll explain the difference to, um, to that. Um, if you have a statement like, there exists a y for all x, such that x plus y equals x, okay? That's basically the existence of, a, of an, uh, an identity element in, in, in arithmetic, right? Um, that statement means there's a single y, and it's the same y for all x, right? So you just need a single you know, gensim for that y to, to capture that placeholder. But if I say um, for all x there exists a y such that x plus y equals zero, I'm actually saying that there's a different y for each x. Okay, it's, it's, uh, and that's, and that's um, where Skolem functions come in because then what you do is you'd use a Skolem function <coughs> as a function of, uh, of x um, and depending on the value of x you get a different y. You know. Okay. Um, okay. Second order predicate calculus, I mentioned already. Predicates and clauses can be arguments. You can make meta statements. It's very powerful. We do that in English all the time. Um, when you start doing that, you get into trouble very quickly. 
um, because you can have paradoxes and you can have things that um, as Goidel showed us that basically can't be assigned a truth value. So the penalty you pay by using second order logic is you're now you know, um, in the realm of a system that's potentially incomplete. Um, okay, finally what I want to talk about, the most popular form of clause in, in AI is something known as a Horn clause. It's from a Scandinavian mathematician called Horn. And according, this is, um, well, whenever I just paste it in definition from Wikipedia, I make it very explicit. In computational logic, a Horn clause is a clause with at most one positive literal. And you may wonder, you know, like, why would they define something like that? And the answer is very simple. Um, you want to write statements of the form A and A, A1 and A2 and dot 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 AN implies B. And as you know, in mathematics, A implies B is defined as not A or B. And when you apply not to, to this conjunction of, of terms, you get a disjunction of negated terms. And so you end up with exactly one positive literal and then all the other ones are negative literals. Um, horn clauses are typically written in the form left-hand side, right-hand side, where the left-hand side is your positive literal and the right-hand side is this disjunction of, a, of, clause, of a conjunction of clauses. So. Okay, um, are there any questions at this point? Or, um, am I going too fast? <coughs> No? Okay, good. Uh, uh, do you, can you get any higher order logic than second order predicate calculus? Yes, I really don't know what third order or fourth order logic would be. I don't know if it has to do with the, the amount of nesting you do in terms of the meta ness. It doesn't get any worse. That's the yeah, it doesn't get any worse, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I imagine it probably has to do with the meta ness, basically. Yeah. You know, I guess meta meta statements would be third order logic. Okay. Yeah, but, but you're, you're dead as soon as you hit second order, so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. Um, so now that we have this wonderful representation, what can we do with it? One of the things we can do is we can reason, which is, you know, kind of the idea behind getting computers to be intelligent. And in order to, um, in order to use this representation, right, we have facts, which are like grounded clauses, you know, like mother or Jane Bill. And then we have these rules that say, you know, A implies B. And in order to match them, they developed an algorithm called the unification algorithm. It's one of the most famous algorithms in AI to some extent. And it basically provides some um, clausal pattern matching and variable binding. So for example, uh, you know, uh, the unification, if you implemented the unification algorithm, you might have a function called unify, and it would take two clauses and try to unify them. Okay, they have to, they have to be congruent in terms of number of terms, you know, otherwise there's a, an arity, um, you know, uh, issue. Um, and here's an example. If I unify P of X with P of, P of A and Q of X, that would actually return bindings of X bound to A and Y bound to Q of X. And then if you instantiate those bindings into the clause, you get P, P of A and Q of A. Okay. Now there's one issue, there's one thing that unification algorithms don't usually handle, and that's binding X to P of X. Because when you try to instantiate that, that would, go, that would be like an infinite recursion. <coughs> Um, I actually have an implementation unification algorithm where I let you unify to a particular extent. It's kind of like a macro expand one. It only does one level, so you don't end up in an infinite loop. Um, there's another really important algorithm um, called the Reedy algorithm. <coughs> if you think about it, uh, rule-based system... Before you go on, the other main application <coughs> of unification is type inference. Uh, you put together your... You, you, you make you deduce facts about bits of your program, and you say, "Well, this must be consistent with that." And, so, and these are the types that fall out. That's that's a m probably more familiar place where unification is being done, though most people don't realize it. Okay. So this would fall into the realm of compiler theory. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In, in a small way. In a small way. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, okay. So. Expert systems and rule-based systems, you have this problem of like you have all these facts and you have all these rules. And in order to find like, you know, to do proofs or to reason, you have to match your facts to your rules. And that's a very, very computationally intensive problem. Um, so somebody at CMU 1974, 4G, uh, invented an algorithm called um, the Reedy algorithm that addresses that issue. And um, I'm not going to give you the details of the Reedy algorithm, um, but I'll tell you that it addresses the many, many matching problem. Um, it's kind of based, I think, my, if I remember correctly, it's kind of based on this notion of linear programming and kind of caching things along the way. But if you really want to read a really cool account of it, um, volume three of Knuth actually has a, an implementation of it in assembly language. So. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so when you, when you start reasoning with rules, okay, so we saw the rules are the form A implies B, right? Well, you can either try to match things on the A side, on the left-hand side, or you can match things on the right-hand side. And depending on what you do, you're basically moving um, in two different directions through your, your space of, of rules. So backward chaining reasoning um, basically starts with the conclusion and tries to find a path through the rule system to things that are known. Okay, so whereas forward chaining reasoners start with things that are known and hope to arrive at the conclusion that was desired. Um, prologue is a forward is a forward chaining reasoner. Now there's actually backward. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, I stand corrected. Oh, you're right, you're right, and you get, yeah, but it does, oh, you're right, okay, okay, never mind, never mind. How many prologue programmers does it take to change the light bulb? Yeah, I don't know. No. no. <laughs> yeah, I know. yeah, I know it works by uh, resolution refutation, so, okay, so never mind, that's just wrong. Um, now, the reason, the, the way you decide whether to use backward chaining reasoning or forward chaining reasoning, um, actually, it turns out that if you're, um, if your branching factor is large, then it's advantageous to do backward chain reasoning. And if the depth of your rules, in other words, you have a lot of like A implies B, B implies C, C implies D, etc., so you, you know, your, your, your chain is really long, then um, forward chaining is, is, uh, is better. So. Now, as you can imagine, you know, with like top, you know, top down, and you can compare this a little bit to top down, bottom up, you know, kind of methods, right? And as you know, that one thing that falls out of that, those approaches is this idea of mixed method you know, mixed method. You do a little bit of top down, a little bit of bottom up, and, and hopefully you meet somewhere in the middle, right? But of course, every once in a while you have something like this, right? And you know, your top down goes this way and your bottom up goes this way. So there was um, a system actually developed in 1969 called GPS, and back then people were extremely ambitious and actually stood for general problem solver. <laughs> um, and they, um, they basically used mixed method of, um, of reasoning. They did a little bit forward, a little bit backwards. And they came up with a solution to this problem here because when you do this, you basically create all these islands in the space, in the, in the, in the search space. And they developed a technique called island hopping to actually try to bridge together the top down and the bottom up pieces. So it's, it's, it's very famous. Um, uh, Backward chaining is, is subroutine calling, forward chaining is inlining. Ah. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, that makes sense. You're, he's gonna, John's gonna restate everything in the context of programming languages and, and compiler theory, okay? <laughs> Which is very good, actually, very good. Providing a bridge here between AI and, uh, and in the world of systems, systems world, okay? Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about semantic nets. Um, semantic nets are basically a graph, and they're a graphical representation of first order logic. Um, it's actually, they, the, the two, you can actually prove that the two representations are equivalent in expressive power. Um, they're typically a label directed and weighted graph. Um, one of the things that they were used to represent was something called is a hierarchy. It's basically this is a this is a this is a this. Um, and using those kind of, of hierarchies, you can actually do something called subsumption, which is. Um, if I know that, that elephants are mammals and that mammals have four legs, I can infer that elephants have four legs okay, through, through the, the use of subsum subsumption. Because the concept of mammals subsumes the concept of elephant. So anything that's true of mammals can be true of elephant. Okay. Um, one of the most famous um, implementations of semantic nets is a system called KL1 by Ronald Brockman, and that goes back to 1985. And since then, there's been a whole family of KL1-like languages and systems uh, developed. Um, nodes in your semantic net are called concepts. And in the world of semantic nets, they, they distinguish primitive concepts from defined concepts. And uh, the difference is that a defined concept is something that you know how to classify, whereas a primitive concept is something that there's a lot of incomplete knowledge associated to it. Um, and this goes hand in hand with, with a, another kind of knowledge representation data type that was invented by Marvin Minsky called frames. Um, the easiest way to think of a frame is kind of like a template, like a class, you know, where you basically have a collection of attribute value pairs and the values haven't been specified yet. And, and part of having the concept be well defined is actually matching, you know, filling in those, uh, filling in the values. So there's kind of this relationship between object-oriented languages. Uh, in fact, object-oriented languages are considered to be a frame language. So, 
and of course you get the inheritance that you get. You know, um, so you can think of um, you can think class definitions and class as frames, you know, where the slots are the attribute value pairs, basically. Okay. Um, okay. So. Okay, now I want to tell you what a hypergraph is. I don't know that most semantic nets use hypergraphs, but I've been advocating hypergraphs since, since I thought up of the concept. Um, and I'll give you, first of all, I'll give you a definition. A hypergraph is a graph where you can actually have edges between edges and vertices. Okay? Um, and people don't, you don't see that too often. Um, but it turns out hypergraphs are actually a very natural and convenient way of representing sentences and meta statements. And I'll give you an example. Um, there's this guy John, and he has a sister J- Jane, and he loves his sister. You know, they just had a wonderful childhood, and they're they're really good good buddies. You know, they they love each other. And John also has a best friend called Jim, and they went to high school together, and they're still friends today. They play golf on Saturday mornings, and um, it turns out that his sister Jane was Jim's high school sweetheart, and and they got married. But you know what? John never thought it was a good match. You know, he, he really he wasn't very happy about the marriage. And in some sense, he disapproves of the marriage. Now, this is not a statement about how John feels about Jane. And it's not a statement about how John feels about Jim. It's a statement about how John feels about the relationship between Jim and Jane. So it's very natural to create an edge from John to that, to that edge. You know, I mean, uh, an edge from, yeah, to that edge. And to make matters worse, um, John and Jane's mother, um, that we call mom, um, she was so happy when her daughter got married, you know, she really resents the fact that her son John disapproves of the marriage. Um, so that's actually a meta-meta statement right there, and you can see how, naturally, how natural and simple it is to represent in a hypergraph. Right. Okay. Um, so right now, Babar uses an, an in-memory hypergraph. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, I haven't really fully implemented a semantic net yet. What I've actually implemented, and, uh, and Jay will get a kick out of this, I've actually implemented um, second order propositional calculus. Because you can make meta, meta, sta- you can make meta statements in my, in my formalism, you just can't have variables. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, kind of a, it, you know, it's kind of ironic, a little silly, because usually the logical order is you know, first introduce variables, then introduce you know, meta statements. So. Um, This is definitely higher order logic, no doubt about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a graphical representation of, of second order logic in, in some context, yeah. You know. But isn't it even higher than second? Do you have a statement about a statement about a statement? Yeah, you know what? Um, given the. the um, it doesn't get any worse. Yeah, given the fact that it doesn't get any worse, there's very little um, to gain by differentiating second, third, fourth, fifth order logic. Um, you, you can do what Al does and say, okay, each, each edge magically corresponds to a node. You don't then. You don't then have to introduce yet a third layer of them. Right, right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, in fact, yeah, that's a good point, John, because now that I can have, um, you know, edges linking to edges, right, I can do this as many times as I want without introducing more mechanisms to do the higher order ones, right? Okay, um, was there another question? Wait, did you just say edges? Edges between two edges, or does, does every edge have to be connected to a, a node? No, no, you can actually have edges between edges, yeah. And if you think about it in terms of like English sentences, like if, if you had like, you know, um, the dog chased the cat and the, the cat chased the mouse, you could actually have a, an and edge between those, the two pieces there. You know, so you, there you'd have like an edge between the edges. So. Jay. And it's promiscuous and, and in Kant. Right? Yep. No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was just looking at Gerard's book from about 1990, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not promiscuous in the content, that sort of thing. I don't understand the book. Okay. <laughs> it's a wonderful rant at the beginning. Anyways. Okay. okay. So I am planning on introducing variables into my hypergraph at some point, but I haven't gotten that far yet. <coughs> Um, the ball rolling down the hill is the cause of the man getting out of bed because it slows him on the body. <laughs> There's an edge between an edge. The, the first edge is yeah. the relationship between ball and hill, which is rolling. The second is the relationship between man and bed, which is the parting. The rolling causes the parting. That is from an edge to an edge. I, 
Last year on my uh, on my income tax, I put down uh, when the IRS wants you to put your occupation, I wrote ontologist. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did during 2011. I called ontology. Okay, here's an example of, of uh, an edge between two edges. If you, had, if, you, if you had kind of this predicate, dog chases cat and cat chases mouse, then you could combine them and create a single entity by creating an and edge between the two edges. Okay. No, in this case, because it's a vertex to an edge and then here too, this is saying mom resents that John disapproves that Jane married Jim. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what that's how you would implement it, you know. Um, but there's a there's a difference between representation and implementation, and you know you don't always want to kind of think about things or design or or, or work you know work at the implementation level. Um, I had a long talk with uh, the CEO of Franz uh, um, about Allegro graph and how to do this stuff in Allegro graph because most graph databases will not give you the ability to do that because it's very very it's computationally expensive. I mean, I should mention that too. One of the reasons people shy away from higher order logics is that they're computationally expensive. Okay. But I'm someone who's not willing to compromise expressiveness for the sake of, uh, you know, efficiency. But in a formal sense, there's really anything more expressive. You can truly map it back down. If you're willing to be dirty. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting for this for a long time. Okay. Uh, just want to let you, let you. It's probably worth noting that the, the use of the conjunction there. For instance, uh, can you express transitive closure using only first order logic? Uh, that one, that one, that one I agree with. That's not the way the computer is. Right? It means something else. Because things that would be equivalent in the Turing equivalent, you say one is much more expressive. It means something incredibly low level. It might be a higher logical order. I know, the, I know that nobody in our tells me this. I understand that. At any rate, you can see that you know that. You've got to be careful. Very careful. Once again, you've got to theorize about the universal machine. You don't have to find out any differences. You're talking about something incredibly low level in the sense of number of characters, but it could be very high level. No, it's okay. Actually, actually, your um, those little things serve a purpose because I get to drink some water and take a break. So, <laughs> side, side effects have their advantages once in a while, even in, even in the context of functional programming. So. Okay, yeah, let me explain that. Okay. Um, no, I'm just going to make a comment about it. Yeah. The conjunction there does not raise the order of the logic. That no. graph is, is qualitatively different from the one that the edge yes. is qualitatively yes. different from the one that John gave in his example. Yeah, and from this one. Yeah. It's not a predicate. It's a conjunction. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Right. Yeah. Although, strictly speaking, um, if you think of it in causal form logic, it's a predicate that takes two arguments, each one of which is a clause. Yeah, it can be mapped onto a predicate that says yeah. A is the, is, the, yeah. is the conjunction of B and C. Yeah. See, this is really, yeah, see, this is really something of the form, is our, is our like system. and, and then you have sentence one, sentence two. And normally, in first order logic, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay. 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 So for the, for the folks out in video land, this was an example of connecting an edge to an edge. We have dog chases cat, cat chases mouse, and we can actually have an and edge between these two sentences to create a compound sentence. And to your point, it is second order logic because um, this is really a sentence. And predicates in first order logic don't take, you know, in other words, this is, this is really, um, here, let me rewrite this, you'll see. Okay. Um, this can really be written as and. Chases, you know, a dog, cat, and chases um, a cat, mouse. Okay, you can't have clauses in first order logic in your is arguments to your predicates. I mean, it's not a very interesting case of second order logic. I'll, I'll grant you that. Uh, okay. but but it is strictly speaking would fall on, on the heading of uh, of of second order logic. The, con the conjunction of those two, you're calling that a second order statement? If you think, if you think of the, I mean, 
This is a hard one because AND is actually an operator in first order logic. If, if that's your point, then absolutely. I mean, okay. But my point is that the, as, as an operator in first order logic, its arguments are not sentences. Its arguments are, 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 are ground literals or, or variables. That's the point. Okay? So, so this is like a second, this is like AND, and squared. That now, it's not really the AND that you're thinking of. Because the AND that you're thinking of takes literal arguments. This AND actually takes clauses that are is arguments. Okay. Even though semantically it's the uh, same idea. Um, hi, Jay. Now, if you wiggle them, you can tell the difference, right? Right, right, right. There you go. There you go. <laughs> okay. So, all right, good. Um, okay. Now we're going to talk about natural language processing. Um, and uh, I'll ask my friend Bob to correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Bob is a recent... Columbia PhD in natural language processing, so soon to be, okay, he's really the expert here. Uh, uh, oh, great, thanks. Yeah. Okay, yeah. This is great having people deal with my environment, you know, I don't have to deal with it, it's great. <laughs> okay, Jay, go for it. Um, how did you make these slides? How did I? <laughs> I confess I used, I used um, PowerPoint on Windows, I'm sorry. Okay. You already know de What does that mean? Oh. And now tech. Oh, 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 I got you. Okay, okay. Yeah. For all, and then you run through the tech machine, and you see a little thing like an upside down A. Ah. Of course, for most of us. Yeah, yeah. You know, you want to de So you So you draw in your browser window an upside down A you're at the site called Detectify. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, I mean, it, it really baffled me that I couldn't find the upside down A because I used to use it like yeah. 20 years ago in ASCII. You know. Unicode yeah, right. I, I don't know why it's not in the PowerPoint. I just haven't, I'm pretty new to PowerPoint, so. Okay, so there's, there's three major um, aspects to natural language processing. And the, it's lexical analysis, syntactic analysis, and semantic analysis. Lexical analysis is Understanding the role and the morphological nature of words. Um, it deals with uh, morphology, orthography, and parts of speech. And I'll tell you more about that on the next slide. I have a whole slide on each one of these topics. Um, uh, they typically are associated, programs that do lexical analysis are typically associated to lexicons, like dictionaries, repositories, various repositories of words. Um, and um, programs that do this kind of analysis are often referred to as scanners or lexical analyzers. Um, there's, a, there's a parallel between natural language processing and programming language processing. You know, uh, and, and in this particular case, you could think of like ScanGen and Lex, which have been around forever on Unix systems, is kind of sort of being the equivalent of you know, the, what's going on on the lexical side. Um, syntactic analysis is all about understanding the grammatical nature of groups of words. And they usually involve the use of grammars, and we'll talk about that too. Uh, programs that do this are typically called parsers. Um, and they basically take the output of the scanners, which are typically called tokens, and um, produce something called a parse tree. And a parse tree is basically a, um, uh, a traversal through a grammar. And, and I'll, I'll show you that uh, soon. Um, there are different ways of doing natural. Nat, um, there are different ways of doing parsing. Um, there, are one very common one is is, is the top-down approach. You know, you start at some entry point to your grammar and you try to find a path through the grammar. Um, and um, the most common algorithm there is called recursive descent parsing, and that's actually what I've implemented in in, in Babar. Um, there's also bottom-up parsers, and there you basically start with the words and you try to find you do kind of clustering at a very low level, you try to group things into noun phrases and verb phrases and then build higher level clusters. And of course, as in all cases, there's also mixed method approaches. Um, and the, uh, the analogy to programming languages here would be like parse gen and yak. Um, it, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not an exact analogy, but you know, it's... Okay. Um, semantic analysis, uh, I'm actually a little more vague on this, but my understanding of it is it basically involves extracting phrase structure from parse trees to produce statements in some kind of knowledge representation language. 
Um, there's a lot of other aspects to semantic analysis because there's a lot of things that come up, like for example in English, you know, you have pronouns and you need to figure out what pronouns refer to. Um, you need to worry about agreement between things. It's very, very easy to create um, ambiguous statements in English. Um, and it's very easy to create, to give somebody the illusion that you're talking about something else. In fact, the whole um, sitcom, you know, American sitcom is based on that, right? <laughs> you know, uh, these misunderstandings, right? So let me give you an example. For example, if I say um, the frog in the pond with the green skin, the prepositional phrase with the green skin refers to the frog. But if I say the frog in the pond with the fish, then with the fish refers to the pond. Okay? There's no way of syntactically knowing which is which. That's something that has to be done at the, at the semantic level. Um, and I, I'm not exactly sure what the, what the theory is in NLP of how they do that. Um, I can't imagine doing it without having knowledge about what frogs are and what ponds are and stuff, you know. What's that? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, he, took the, he took the manuscript out of the briefcase and threw it in the sea. Yeah. Well, went in the sea. Yeah, but right. Because you don't know. But in French, you do. Because yeah. luckily, they have different genders. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, language, I mean, natural language, is, it's very easy to be to create ambiguities in, um, in, in natural language. That's why, like, you know, we have a language called legal, you know, uh, uh, legal language. What's that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you have the 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 ambiguities can be at the word level. Um, Peter Norby gave a talk at uh, the Museum of Mass um, opening called uh, "ABC as Easy as One Two Three. I mean, a bunch of us from this group went, and he gave the example of the word "bank." You know, a bank can be a financial institution, or it could be the bank of a river. And but you don't know which one by looking at the word bank. I mean, they're two totally, com completely different things. Um, most of the time, there's, there's enough surrounding context to decide which one is being referred to. Okay. Um, so anyway, I just want to mention one of, the, one of the first knowledge representation languages that was actually developed was uh, by Winograd and Bob Rowe. Um, Winograd is, a, is actually a really big name in natural language processing. He's at Stanford University. He wrote a book called Language as a Cognitive Process, Volume 1, Syntax. Um, I waited 10 years for Volume 2, Semantics, to come out, but it never came out. <laughs> um, and Bob Rowe is one of the authors of uh, The Art of the Meta Object Protocol. When they did KRL, they were actually at Xerox PARC. Um, uh, Okay, so lexical analysis. Of Go routines, at least from one point of view. What's that saying? Also, the inventor of Go routines, at least from one, one point of view. view. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think I, I know him for the AMOP, actually. Yeah, he came and talked at a Lisp conference in uh, in California. Uh, talked about copy machines, actually. Uh, this whole process that he designed for the flow of paper through a copy machine. It's really, really intense. <laughs> okay, morphology concerns itself with word morphing, the rules that govern word morphing. So for example, the fact that foxes is fox plus plural um, is an example of a morphological rule. Um, orthography um, is the rules that govern spelling. Um, so the fact that the plural of fox is formed by fox plus es is an example of an orthographic rule. Um, the two go hand in hand, I mean they go together. I had a hard time initially wrapping my, my head around uh, the difference because um, you know they seem very similar but um, you know, again, really that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think I, I took um I took four years of Latin and two years of classical Greek and I never I didn't think I'd ever miss it. But having declensions and things like that is really really convenient. Having words tell you like what their role is in the sentence and what they're doing is is really cool. Huh. Right, right, yeah. Um, okay, so the next um, kind of and I'm, this is very kind of um this isn't like a continuous you know talk on lexical analysis. I'm just trying to give you some you know a heads up on on some of the major components. You know, like I said, their entire book's written on this, so you can't imagine you know knowing the entire field with one slide. But one thing that's very important in, in natural language processing, from a, a theoretical point of view at least, is something called a transducer. Now, um, I assume everybody's familiar with a finite state automaton. Um, okay. A finite state automaton basically captures a potentially 
infinite collection of strings. Okay, it could be finite, but it could be infinite. A transducer captures an infinite set or finite set of pairs of strings. And with with NFAs, basically, you know, you can think of it like is you're traversing some network, and and your each arc is consuming an input symbol. Um, with a transducer. It's the same thing, except that not only are you consuming input symbols, you're also generating output symbols at the same time. Um, as a result of that, um, they're useful for, for parsing, they're useful for, for generating um, output, and they're also useful for translating. Okay. Um, and, um, I, I don't get the parsing part anymore. Um, I'll give you, there's an example actually. I'll give you an example um, right here, actually. See, for example, um, in, in lexical analysis, they, one model is that you have these three different levels. You have a surface level, which is basically um, foxes. You have an intermediate level, foxes, fox plus ES. And then you have a lexical level, fox plus noun plus plural. So what you have here is two transducers, um, one to go from this to this, and one to go from this to this. Okay, and in that sense, you can think of it as, you know, as, as this is kind of a parsing, a lexical parsing, let me say, specify, lexical parsing process. Okay. Um, so just, to, just for completeness, um, formally, mathematically, you define uh, a transducer with a set Q of, of states, um, an input alphabet sigma, an output alphabet delta. Uh, you identify Q0 as a start state. Then you have a subset of QF, that's your final states. And then you have two transition functions. You have a transition function um, Q to W. Um, I'm sorry, is that right? Yeah. Um, that maps input symbols to, um, to, a new, uh, to a new state. Yeah, and then the other one maps the, the output symbols. Yeah, it's a Turing machine that can't read its tape. It, it, uh, it, it reads this tape and it writes that tape and never the twins will meet. Right, right, right. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you want me. Can you speak up? Of the finite state um, machine yeah. and uh, parsing, does that have anything to do with how uh, finite state, the finite state machine, that model is used to create like, a regular expression parser? Yes, yeah. yes, Precisely. yes, exactly. Here, so, we have like, a character in each string and you, you, you put, it has the input, either going yeah. forward or... Yeah. Forward. Now imagine you wanted to take your regular expression and convert it to a different regular expression. Then you could use a transducer for that. Okay, then you output. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, as you're consuming input, you're generating output. That's the basic idea. Yeah. Um, What's the oh, um, um, the question was, is this applicable to regular expressions? Okay. <laughs> 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 Sorry, that's the watered down version, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. After all, they were done by the same dozen people. That's right. Yeah, Turing. That's right. That's right. Aho, Hopcroft, Allman, Turing, Church, all those people. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, and Knuth, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing what people accomplished back then. It really, you know, and they didn't even have, you know, they had like, you know, they didn't even have computers. <laughs> 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 right, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. It certainly wasn't easy for Google to, to invent this without a computer, but he managed. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, okay, the other thing I just want to mention, um, uh, oh yeah, so um, uh, I, I, I kind of skipped over this really quickly, but in English we have parts of speech. And that kind of, um, they basically identify the role of the word in the sentence. And we use those parts of speech to describe grammars, and you'll see that coming up soon. So we have things like nouns and verbs and prepositions and things like that, right? Um, one of the um, most common, commonly accepted model now of parts of speech is this thing called the pen tree book parts of speech tags. Um, I'm sorry? Pen tree bang. Pen tree bang? You mean with a G? No, bank. Bank, Pentry Bank, sorry, <laughs> okay, okay. Pentry Bank, yeah. Um, and there's actually about, about 50 different um, parts of speech. Um, you know, they, they actually distinguish noun plural from noun singular and things like that. So there's a complete list in the uh, inside cover of uh, Jurafsky and Martin, which has uh, become kind of the de facto NLP book these days. Okay. Um, and that's in the list of references at the end. Um, 
break is called parser when it's really lex lexer. In the previous slide, you made a distinction between parser. Yeah, um, I, when I used the term parser for the duration of this slide, um, because it was the, you know the lexical analysis slide, there was kind of this. It was in the package lex, you know, lex. Um, so I'm, I was talking about lexical parsers, and it's a little confusing. But people actually talk about um, uh, about you know what would normally be called a scanner. Um, you know, refers to as, an, as a lexical parser. Okay. 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 The other thing I didn't mention, um, the very last bullet on this slide is that recently, uh, I don't know when this dates back to, but there have been a whole bunch of probabilistic approaches to doing this kind of stuff. Um, and those are, they're based on something called an engram. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of what that is, it's just beyond the scope of this uh, thing. But I will tell you that it involves counting word frequency. Um, there's a very good treatment of it in chapter 4 of Jurafsky and Martin. And it is the basis for what, how Google Translate works. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the implementation of, of my lexical analyzer. Um, I don't use transducers. I've kind of deviated from what people do. Sometimes people do things that are just so complicated, they don't make sense to me. I just, I go and reinvent the wheel. Hopefully not badly. Um, uh, I had a boss who used to, who used to see, always tell me, you know, I don't mind you reinventing the wheel, Ray. Just don't reinvent it badly. You know? so, Hexagonal. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny, I was, I, was, uh, I was look browsing through images on the web once and I found this image of um, uh, it was some kind of old-fashioned cart, you know those carts that the horses used to pull? And uh, it said where the wheels were square. And I thought to myself, ah, this is what it means to reinvent the wheel badly. So, <laughs> um, Unless the road is like this. Yeah, right, right that's right, that's right. <laughs> Good point. Okay, so... Um, a long, long time ago, if people want a lexicon, they would have to hand code it. Um, it turns out now with the, with, the, with the web and with all this wonderful knowledge that's out there, all that information is already there. So I wrote a little kind of um, parser, not a parser, but it's more like regular expressions. I basically use Merriam-Webster website to look up all my words. Okay, so if, if I run into a word, I don't know it, I ask Merriam-Webster. And it turns out he's, that's stuff he knows really well. Um, <laughs> um, so, so I basically go there, I get the page. You know, there's, I, I looked at the source code and I saw some particular sequence of characters that uniquely identifies where the part of speech is in the HTML source, and I just pull it out. I mean, nothing really fancy there. Um, some words um, aren't there, um, like, you know, highly scientific words like elephantidi, which is the Latin name for the family of elephants. Um, and then some words take you to a different word. So if you look up the word traditionally, they actually take you to the page tradition. And when I first started doing this, you know, I got traditionally as a noun, which was wrong. Um, and I'll tell you how I handled that uh, a little bit later. Um, the other thing I did is I, I, I looked to, I went to all these different um, uh, teaching English classes and found lists of irregular words in English and basically compiled some tables that are locally cached to my machine. So the very first thing I do um, is see if, if it's an irregular word. You know, if it's not an irregular word, then I, um, then I actually look and see if it's a morphed word, okay? Because morphed words are not going to be at Merriam-Webster. Merriam-Webster will have the base form, the definition there. Um, so, and the way I, so yeah, so I reverse engineer the words is basically what I do. Rather than having a transducer that produces the right thing, I basically, says, I basically look at the word and say, oh look, you end in L-Y, maybe you're an adverb. And I take off the L-Y and I say, what am I left with? Is this a word? You know. Um, and that's actually worked really well for me. Um, yes? Yes. Um, I actually used WordNet at my previous job and we used it as a dictionary. The problem is WordNet is not a dictionary. Um, I am planning on using WordNet for uh, down the road for semantic analysis, for synonyms and homo homonyms and all those things. What is WordNet? Um, it's... Um, Bob, what is WordNet? <laughs> well, it's basically nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and like 150,000 of them. And yeah. You're packing the taxonomy, so and those now will into the package around the package around the mammal and so forth. And it does all the parts of the speech. Um, not really. No. It's not really. Like, like WordNet doesn't have prepositions. You know, like, like, like two, right. four, in and stuff are not in WordNet. The thing about WordNet is that it discriminates senses. Yeah. It knows that 
you know, it, it knows that, that one meaning of that one meaning of bank is, is tied up with a financial institution. The other one isn't. Oh, that's right. I use the Stanford parser for what I just said, and then word yeah. that after that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I know about Porter Stemmer. Um, I don't necessarily agree that what I'm doing is similar because I think Porter Stemmer is more based on on some kind of probabilis, prob probabilities, right? Okay, I'm not doing anything probabilistic here. Okay, so I tend to shy away from from probabilistic reasoning, and uh, it's it's kind of um it's kind of funny because um it, it's it's really used extensively in data mining. Um, it's what Google does, and I don't want to put it down or say bad things about it because it's produced very, very good results. But what, what amuses me is that um, one of my areas of interest in AI is machine learning. And in the, um, in the 80s, you know, you had, if you looked at the machine learning community, you had a group that was like this big doing neural nets, and then everybody else was like a group this big. And today it's kind of like machine learning is like the world according to Bayes and then everything else, you know. So. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, like the, the talk that I referred to Peter Novi gave, I mean, they're getting like 80 percent, you know, correctness using, using probabilities. You know, the, the, the biggest problem I have with probability, with the probability-based stuff, is that there's no understanding. You know, um, you take Google Translate, it'll do a pretty good job translating from language N to language M, but if you try to translate poetry, it'll do a terrible job. And, like, I have a Chinese friend, every once in a while I, I send her a text message in Chinese by using Google Translate, and she always comes back and says, I, I understand what you're saying, but that's not how you say that in Chinese. You know? so, so I'm, I'm very, very interested in semantics. And the whole probabilistic approach doesn't really create any kind of you know, understanding. Um, not yeah. only that, but you get hosed by the small world theorem. If you make a connection where there should be no connection, pretty soon you have a giant. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Everything means everything else. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, so now let's look at an actual example of, of using analyzed morphed word. So I give it the word traditionally. The very first thing it does, this is like just on system startup, is it kind of auto-initializes, it, lo it loads. A, every time I query the Merriam-Webster, that actually takes a little time. Um, so I locally cache everything. Um, and I have, uh, my lexicon has about 50,000 words right now locally cached. Um, you know, there's only about a million, what is it, uh, a million words in the English language? Yeah. Um, <coughs> It loads the uh, regular nouns table, regular verbs, the auxiliary verbs. Yeah, here, I'll give you another example. Like, uh, that another thing that, that bothered me with the Merriam-Webster is that if you qu query the word A-R-E, um, it turns out A-R-E, you know, it could be a verb, you know, as in we are, or it turns out it can be a noun. And the first part of speech you get back from them is noun. So when I first tried parsing my sentences, you know, my, my sentences were coming out as noun phrases with the word A-R-E, and I'm going, this is crazy. It's like, you know, the most common usage of R, I think everybody would agree, would be as a... So I have a little bit of an issue with Merriam-Webster and the ordering in which the net, the parts of speech comes back. Dictionaries are always put down first. Yeah, well, it's, it's deep. Yeah. Multi-century old tradition. Yeah. Nobody knows why. Yeah. So I actually, as a result of that, I actually, you know, it was an important enough word that I created a, a separate table of, uh, and they're regular verbs anyway, they're regular auxiliaries, and I checked that first, you know. Um, was there another question? I thought I saw a hand wave. No. Okay. So um, then, as you can see, it goes to this URL here. Tradition. <clears throat> so you may be wondering, it's like I gave it the word traditionally, and how did it get the word tradition? So I, my my um, my little algorithm starts with the word traditionally. It noted it notes that adverbs. One way of forming an adverb is by ending in ly. Okay, there there are other ways. So it takes off the ly, produces traditional. Um, then it recursively says, you know, are you a morphed word? And it knows that words that end in al could be an adjective, you know, coming from a noun. So it removes the AL and says, now I have tradition, are you a noun? Um, and it's not, you know, it's not, it doesn't match any of the morph, any of the morphing. Um, so at that point, I query Merriam-Webster. Um, and then I correctly get back base form tradition, actual form traditionally, primary part of speech adverb. The additional field here is really for, for nouns and verbs, because nouns can be singular, plural, or, ne or neutral. Um, and verbs can be, you know, different tenses and first person singular and that stuff. So that's what gets put in the additional field. And then, um, finally, <coughs> um, ver words can actually have several different parts of speeches. So this complete POS is basically a list of all of them. Um, and that's going to be used, right now my, um, my parser doesn't actually explore all possibilities or all possible parses. But I'm not going to be able to do that for too long. Um, you know, it's like it's because you know, because um, the ambiguity is in English, basically. 
Um, what's that? Um, well, that's that's an issue, right? Um, that's definitely an issue. Um, that would, could, I mean, there's no way of really handling that at the lexical level. I mean, that's something you're going to have to handle at the semantic level. You know, the, the best you can, that happens to me all the time with nouns and verbs. You know, because, um, for example, um, uh, he leaves, yeah, third person singular uh, for regular verbs, you add an S at the end. It's, you know, he leaves the room. Okay, but, but adding an S at the end of a word is also a way of forming the plural for certain nouns. You know, so, yeah, actually, um, le a leaf, no, it's leaf. I was trying to think of an example where, net, where the word was both a noun and a, uh, uh, and a verb, um, and both the third person singular and the plural would be the same word. Set. Set. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, set, for example. That's a good example. You know, uh, a set or two set. Um, you know, again, you know, so you see sets, you don't know if it's the plural of sets or the third person singular of the word, the verb to set. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, as I mentioned, my, currently just, and this is just based on the crawling I've done so far. Um, Confused, so, so you see set, what, how do you handle that now? I don't. I don't. Um, whatever comes out first, we'll get, it'll use that. What was the question? Um, the question was, how do I handle um, that example like sets? You know, because sets is both, um, um, the plural of set, and it's also the third person singular of the verb to set. Um, so, strictly speaking, I should really record both those, and, and if one fails, and try the other in terms of the parsing and stuff. But that word in the English language is the word with the most definition, like most different. So, I mean, that's not the same word as No, I've, I've done that. I mean, I have, I have a lexicon of, of uh, nouns that are, have irregular plurals. But the verb, the verb set is regular. There's nothing irregular about it. You just add an S at the end to make the plural. She's talking about the semantic ambiguity set, which is... Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. That's actually a good idea. Yeah. I mean, the problem is that there's so many words in English that have... Set is a word that it has the most. Oh, I see, the most. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Sure. The question is, could you compile a table of irregularities um, at the semantic level, just like you do at the, at the lexical level? That's what you're asking, right? Yeah. And I guess my answer is yes, you could do that. And maybe that's something I'll try um, when I get around to dealing with, with this. Um, okay. I, I just want to mention that I mean, my parser is in a certain state now that I can do a little bit of parsing wiki pages, like simple sentences. Um, I have a tremendous amount of work to do to really take it to the next level. I mean, this is an area where you know I could spend the next 10 years of my life working on this. You know, it's, it, it's a very hard problem, and there's still open issues in natural language processing. Um, you know. Uh, all right. So, okay. Now let's talk about syntactic analysis. So, syntactic analysis, as we mentioned, um, is all about traversing grammars and trying to find some path through the grammar that matches your your sentence. Um, Formally, a grammar um, is defined by four things. Um, you have a set of productions, which are basically um, uh, rules. Um, they're very much like the, you know, like the horn clause rules we saw before, actually, from, uh, from logic. Um, there's a left-hand side, which is a non-terminal symbol. And then there's a right-hand side, which is a disjunction of conjunctions of both terminal symbols and non-terminal symbols. Then you have uh, a set of non-terminal symbols. You have a set of terminal symbols and you have one non-terminal symbol that's designated as the start symbol. Um, this implicitly defines an and or tree. So recursive descent parsing can be thought of as like a traversal through an and or tree. And an and or tree is a tree where alternating levels you have or nodes or and nodes. And when you process an and node, every branch of the and node has to succeed. And when you process an or node, only one branch needs to succeed. Um, you actually have the same situation in theorem proving. Um, with, the, with the horn clauses. So. Um, so loosely stated, a parser takes traverses a grammar while consuming input tokens in an attempt to find a valid path through the grammar that accommodates the tokens. Um, they produce parse trees in which every, is basically a tree in which every internal node is a non-terminal symbol and the leaves are terminal symbols. Um, we talked about DFAs before. And NFAs, and you know, NFA is a non-deterministic DFA. Um, 
the same issues happen in the grammar. Um, you know, you can actually have several productions um, that start with the same non-terminal symbols and you have an issue because you don't know which one to choose. And you typically try them out in the order in which they're, they're declared. Um, but it presents a problem because um, uh, how do you handle non-determinism? And there's three standard, standard ways of handling non-determinism in computer science. One of them is backtracking. One is look ahead. That's used a lot actually in, in compilers. Um, and the other one is parallelism. Um, just try them all at the same time. You know? um, <laughs> um, my, what I've implemented is backtracking. Um, and, um, I hope you're memorizing, otherwise backtracking includes yeah, no, I know, it's very expensive. Um, I don't know that I am or not, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But I am recording everything in a parse tree, so. Um. Yeah, so actually, I, I probably am actually. I probably am implicitly. Um, I actually haven't modified my parser or, or extended it to produce, um, to find all possible parses, but it would be really trivial to do that. Um, the other thing to... to the whole theory called parsing expression grammars or peg grammars, where you... Um, you, 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 you choose a deterministic order in advance and then you do the recursive descent but you memoize as you go so that you never have to go down the same long, long path twice. Oh, okay, okay. It's very cool. Neat, neat, okay. And, and it's, what's, the other thing that's nice about it is it eliminates the distinction between scanners and parsers because it's equivalent to being able to look ahead all the way to the end but because you're memorizing, you're not paying that cost of reading all the way to the end. Oh, uh, I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, neat. But in what, what I understood you say is, is the semantic and parsing were had a uh, more in, in, in compiler scheme and parsing the, the distinction is, is somewhat arbitrary, with, especially with pegram. In natural language processing, it's a real it's a real distinction. Yeah. It's still yeah. arbitrary. Yeah. It's still arbitrary. Word is a is a is a very fuzzy theoretical notion. <laughs> Linguists don't have a definition of word. They don't, any more than biologists have a definition word. of word. Word. <laughs> Uh, but but it's a, here the parsing had to do with whether it was a plural noun or, or something yeah. like that, yeah. and then the semantic had to do with uh, more uh, grammar, more than grammar. Yeah. Uh, of the language grammar. Yeah. And those, yeah. those are very very different. Yeah. The difference between regular expressions and or, or you know LR zero and LR one, um, where LR zero is another name for regular expression. That is what you mean. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to note is that um, you know we all know that trees are you know. O of you know n to the m, where m is the branching factor, or m to, m to the n. So parsing is actually fairly expensive, and as you get more and more productions and build larger and larger grammars, I mean it's a very costly process. Um, um, okay, so what I've done with bars, I've implemented a recursive descent parser. Um, I use backtracking to handle non-terminism. My parser is basically three types of objects, deals with three types of objects: tokens, grammars, and parsed nodes. Um, what I've done with the scanners is kind of cool actually. I've created um, seven fundamental token classes based on character composition. Um, basically based on whether there's, there's alphabetic characters, numeric characters, and special characters. So you end up with alphabetic, numeric, special, alphanumeric, alpha special, numeric special, and alphanumeric special. Um, and I've done this with mixing classes and class. And it's really neat because you can add little methods to just one particular type of token to, to have something happen. It's just um, this is something I thought was neat. Um, I haven't strictly speaking just strictly speaking just written an English parser. I've actually written um, a set of tools to build domain specific parsers. So there's actually um, <laughs> there's actually four different levels um, in in my um, in the way I set things up. Um, in fact, one thing I'd like to do is to actually implement uh, a French parser, an HTML parser. And, um, and maybe a, a Java parser or something using the same set of parsing tools. <laughs> um, okay, so here's a little bit of the API, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time with this because we're probably, I'm not moving fast enough, right? <laughs> I'm like one third done, so. <laughs> Just <to> give you <laughs> well, I'm making it worth your money, you know? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, but I really wanted to get to the cool stuff I'm doing with Wiki. Um, okay, you know, let me skip through this then. Uh, um, Okay, or Wiki. <laughs> that was fast. Um, okay, so Wikipedia has about four million pages. Um, the very first thing I do, well, the very first thing I tried was to just crawl the whole thing, and, and that failed miserably. I got like this big out of memory error. <laughs> so what I decided to do is, I know I'm only going to crawl it to a particular depth. So I start with a topic. Um, I give it a depth, and it basically follows lengths. It crawls 
that number of links away. Um, and that generates a lot of nodes and a lot of links very quickly. Um, so for example, um, I started with the topic elephant, and this had nothing to do with John McCarthy's elephant, but um, it turns out that it turns out to be quite appropriate. Um, so, um, and that actually produces my crawling produces a hash table with 2,580 entries, and each entry is basically a page, and all the links that leave from that page, all the outbound links um, to other wiki pages, not outbound links to other websites. Um, then I have a, a function called generate wiki graph, which takes this hash table and creates a graph object. And what it does basically is it creates a vertex for every key. I don't actually create a vertex for every page. Um, I did initially. Um, and what I got was, um, without pruning, I got a graph with 154,000 vertices and um, half a million edges. Um, so by not creating nodes for pages that I didn't actually um, you know, explore, explore their, their links. Um, I ended up with a graph with 2,500 vertices and 182,000 edges. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because my, um, my notion of concept relevancy is based on the topics that you're linked to. And the edges of the graph weren't really linked to anything. Um, so if anything, they were just confusing the issue. And if you really want them included, then you can just crawl to n plus 1 and you'll get them included on, in the n plus 1 graph, most likely. Um, I also did a crawl of depth 4, just to give you an idea of how quickly things grow. Um, and this is from the page elephant. Um, 25,000 vertices, 2.3 million edges. Um, and I also, one thing I was really curious is I'd love to actually be able to build the full wiki graph. Yes, Mark? What's the old three? Is that the pruning factor? I was about to talk to you about that. No, it's, it's a measure of connectivity. Um, a complete graph on n vertices has um, n times n plus 1 over 2 edges, which is O of n squared. So I wanted to figure out, um, you know, if, if all the, if these 25, if these 2,580 pages were all connected to each other, you know, it's basically this number squared, well, actually stick it into this formula of how many edges you have. So since I had a lot of edges, I wanted to know how connected the, the things were. Um, and this is, gives me a 2.7% connectivity. Um, it's not a formal measure of graph connectivity, but it's just some idea of, you know, if it was a complete graph, like, you know, so I have quite a ways to go before I reach a complete graph is, is the point here. Um, I, I'd love to be able to build a full wiki graph and actually identify weak links that would kind of um, um, disconnect the graph, if such things exist, right? <laughs> um, because it would kind of give you an area, you know, you could can kind of decompose wiki into various topic areas, you know. Um, and this is all doable using, you know, paging schemes for the graph or, or buying a 64 gig machine or something, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm doing all this in, in, two, ga in two gig memories, okay. <laughs> Just so you know. Um, yeah. All right. Um, okay. Oh, now we're getting some fun stuff. Okay. So I said early on, one thing I want to do is to build taxonomies of wiki topics, okay? And here's an example. So I distinguish three types of links from a web page. I distinguish internal links, external links, and internal links. Internal is a word I made up, and it means links to, to that same page. Um, you know, kind of intramural sports, you know. Um, <laughs> I chose elephant page as my entry page for crawling. There's 228 internal links from the elephant page, and these occur throughout 103 paragraphs of text. Um, I have a function that actually does read the, read the page in and breaks it up into paragraphs, um, and paragraphs into sentences, and then parses the sentences, etc. Um, the goal here, um, with respect to the, the page names, to the links, is to basically create a meaningful taxonomy with these 228 links. So how do I take these 228 links and put them in a tree? Because right now it's just a list of 228 things. An example of that would be taking like, you know, elephant points to Asian elephant and African elephant, and then African elephant points to African bush elephant. These aren't actual links. Um, this is an organization of the topics. These aren't actual links now. This is me taking these words and organizing them into a meaningful taxonomy. And what I'm actually doing is I'm actually taking my natural language parser and I'm parsing the wiki page names in English because they're, they're noun phrases. You know, African forest elephant is a noun phrase. Um, and it's actually kind of cool. Um, so I basically then partition the link names into um, subtopic, supertopic, and related. So like African elephant would have a supertopic of elephant and a subtopic of these two guys. And then the other links that don't contain African elephant in them would just be related topics. 
Um, and then the related topics I partitioned into strongly and weakly related based on link bidirectionality. So if the pages point to each other, then I consider that strongly related. That's just my, my definition in this context. Um, um, okay, so how do I actually create these taxonomies? So here's kind of a, an algorithm. And I'm sorry for all the wordiness of the slides. I mean, the good news is you can go home and you'll actually they'll make sense um, instead of just having, you know, <laughs> four by four, <laughs> you know. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing I do is produce a set of candidates. So I go through all the, I map over all the edges and consider for every edge, I look at the source and target uh, vertex and, and I parse them using my natural language parser. And if I produce a set of tokens such that the tokens from the source are a subset of the tokens in the target, then I consider them to be a candidate for being a subtopic. Okay? Um, does that make sense? So for example, you know, there's a page called elephant, right? And that parses to the single token elephant. And then there's a page called African elephant. That parses in two tokens, African and elephant. And elephant is contained in African and elephant. So they're, they're potentially, uh, it's a candidate. The reason I say candidate is that um, there's something very funny that happens in English. Um, is I actually get quite a lot of false positives, right? Remember, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to find subtopics for elephant. And not everything that's related to elephant is a subtopic of elephant. One of the concepts I came up with or found was something called um, elephant hotel, okay? Now, elephant hotel is not a subtopic of elephant. It's a noun phrase whose subject is hotel. So it's actually a type of hotel rather than a type of elephant. Um, an elephant hotel, I mean a hotel elephant on the other hand, would be a type of elephant. And, and, and this is something that, you know, the, the, the kind of indexing they do with web pages and stuff would not pick up. They're just looking at words independently, individually. And this is actually now using language techniques to kind of, uh, you can think of this as doing some kind of semantic indexing rather than just, uh, you know, string-based indexing. Um, okay, so we eliminate false positives based on on, on um, figuring out the subjects of each phrase, of the two phrases, and um, making sure they're identical. Now, strictly speaking... Just considering the names of the pages, right? This is just the names of the pages. Yeah, yeah. I'm not even looking at the content yet. Yeah. Excuse me? Hotel Elephant... Um, hotel Elephant could be the name of a hotel. But strictly speaking, in English, if you saw the term, the phrase, hotel elephant, I mean, you know, from an English perspective, hotel is being used as an adjective to qualify elephant, and so in some sense, that would be a type of elephant. Uh, yeah. Hotel Pennsylvania is not a type of Pennsylvania. Exactly, yes, yes. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's actually a good point. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how um, this approach, I mean, doesn't work all the time because of that. Okay, um, one of the things we do in natural language is we call things by names that they aren't. Um, and that creates a lot of uh, problems, okay? Um, yeah. Yeah. But no, your point is well taken. There's only so many, so much semantics in names, and, and sometimes names have no semantics, so. Oh, you've never seen those elephants hang around the bar drink pina coladas? <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> okay. Yeah, right, that's right. That's right. Dude, good, good, Mark. I like that. That was good. Your probabilistic algorithm yeah. is very simple. You, you, you pick one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm um, getting back to this. So the, the second step is eliminating the false positives. Um, at that point, I'm pretty, I'm pretty convinced that all my pairs of topics are of the form topic, subtopic. And what I do is I replace, when I create the graph, um, the name of the edge, the label on the edge between every, every pair of vertices is just related to, like this generic edge label. So now I replace the related to uh, links, uh, names, with generalizes, and I actually create the inverse relation to specializes. Um, once I've done that, I eliminate the direct generalizes relationships between children and ancestors. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, what my algorithm is going to do here is it's actually going to create, uh, it's going to find that it's going to have a pair, elephant and African bush elephant, and it's actually going to create a specializes, a generalizes link between these two. But since I'm trying to set up a, a, a taxonomy rather than a complete graph, um, I eliminate, whoops, uh, I eliminate, there would be the direct link from here to here that says that this concept specializes this concept, and generalizes this concept. Um, 
Okay, finally, uh, I'm left with a number of, um, out of those 228 uh, topic names, I'm left with a number of them that are just singletons and that don't have any subtopics. And I just get rid of those. Well, I don't get rid of them, but I, I put them aside um, as, as, as of yet to be classified. You buried them in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and finally, what I return to the end of this is the forest of trees. Okay? And, and this is actually really neat because what I have now is I've taken 2,580 topics and created a forest of 131 trees consisting of 1,500 nodes, um, which is 62% of the topics, and leaving 986 yet to be classified. Okay, and, and this is with no you know, embedded domain knowledge in the system, you know, which is, which is kind of cool. So if we take a look, and, and here's where some of the cleverness is coming out, or some of the, um, the semantic value, the semantic side of things you can see. Um, here's my elephant tree, right? So the, the topic is elephant. You have a whole bunch of um, elephant subtopics. Um, you even have top subtopics of subtopics. And you get all sorts of different types of elephants. I mean, you get, you get actual um, uh, elephants like uh, the, the African elephant. You get instances of, of, uh, of elephants like Babar the elephant. Um, which, by the way, I grew up on when I was a little kid. I read Babar. You know, I'm from French. I grew up French, so you know that's where I got the name for the system. Um, I was so happy when I saw that pop up. And we also get um, Horton the elephant. You know, we've all read Dr. Seuss, Horton Hears a Who. I'd actually forgotten that Horton was an elephant. So, <laughs> um, and um, and then you get like war elephant, which is actually not a type of elephant, but it's more of a usage of elephant. Okay? But the good news is that these things are all clustered together now in, under this thing. And this is just based on the page names. Now notice there, was, there were other page names that had the word elephant in it, like a southern elephant seal. And that actually got placed under elephant seal rather than under elephant. And we also have elephant intelligence, and that got placed under intelligence. The other thing that's neat is if you look at the list of uh, intelligence topics here, there are a lot of different animal intelligences, which is kind of normal because I'm starting from the page elephant. So you're, you're starting to see a little bit of semantic relevance kind of surfacing up on its own. And of course, I mean, this just popped up and it was just, it had to pop up, right? Artificial intelligence, right? Now, so what did you do to get the elephant seal tree separate from the elephant tree? Um, that's seal elephant. Because it's, um, I'm sorry, uh, um, Cause see, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because seal is the subject of elephant seal. Yeah, exactly. He's paying attention. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, that's that's actually what does it, and that's actually again where the, the NLP is adding value. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Now there are issues here, and this is where getting to your point, where in English people don't always call things what they are. For example, they have these things called sea lions. And from an English perspective, this is a type of lion. <laughs> so sea lions got classified in the lion tree. <laughs> and this makes perfect sense, okay? Now, I thought about this really long and hard. And it turns out that a better name for sea lions would have been lion seal, okay? And that would have actually been classified properly. And it turns out that sea lions have recently, um, it's really funny, I actually read the wiki page on it. They've recently been... Um, put into the seal category. So sea lions really are seals now. Okay. They used to have two different families for them before, but they merged them. So, um, you know, and so, so this is where, you know, you know, there's nothing to do. Then, then the other thing that's interesting is you have these, um, these other, to these are like metatopics that are like now the interaction between two topics, like tiger versus lion. You know, there's a wiki page on that. And that's not really a subtopic of lion or a subtopic of tiger. <laughs> Uh, so, exactly, exactly, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but you, you know, what's fun, what's fun about this is um, I actually love uh, zoology, um, and I, I started off as a biology major, so this is a lot of fun for me doing this kind of stuff. Yes? Can, can you speak up? Instead of using uh, parts of exclusively, how about adding human feedback so that you can say, see why is not part of why? You know, that, um, that's, putting a human into the loop is definitely, um, you know, something that's a, that's a good idea. I mean, in fact, if you think of, a, of, of us going to school and the whole learning process, we have kind of a mentors that, that guide us. Um, the problem is that there's four million wiki pages, um, and you can imagine how much effort it was. I'm trying to leave the human out of the loop as much as possible. I'm trying to push the envelope of what I can do automatically in a correct way 
um, you know, for. I'm actually, believe it or not, this actually doesn't bother me, and I'll tell you why. Because when I start doing um, all these different animal taxonomies, um, when we get to a little further, I'm going to talk about concept relevancy and how I use this particular similarity metrics. I can actually run a validation thing. And if I compare sea lion to lion or to seals, it's going to be much more semantically relevant to seals, at which point I might move this whole you know, subtree somewhere else in the, in the, in the, in the graph. I've That's got a list of 1,560 concepts that people have tried to review um, repeatedly over 50 years. Very few people get more than halfway through the list before they <laughs> Besides, the, if you go beyond the Wikipedia titles and the Wikipedia text, a lot of the Yeah, exactly, e exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's not uh, like these names are being assigned at random there. They're coming from a lot of intelligence in the first place. Exactly, exactly. There's knowledge embedded in the names. And right now I'm trying to exploit that to the maximum. I want to see how far can I get with that. And then, of course, to your point, once I start bringing in the content, I mean, that should really kind of dot the I's and cross the T's in terms of the, of the taxonomy. Um, okay. Um, so, okay, so now that we have all these subtopics of elephant, um, one thing I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of break them up into groups because, you know, for example, you know, Babar and, and Horton and Elmer kind of belong in one group, right? You know, it's like the fictional elephants. And then, you know, the Asian and the Asian African stuff, they belong to other cluster and stuff. So, I want to talk a little bit first about clustering in general. Um, there's two ways to look at clustering. Okay, you can think of it in a top-down way where you take a set and break it up into subsets. Or you can think of it in terms of taking data points and putting them into groups. Okay. Um, a lot of the clustering algorithms I've worked with have actually been more um, bottom-up approaches. Um, clustering goes hand-in-hand -hand with classification. Um, because once you have clusters, you can use them as, as classes, basically. Um, they typically involve some kind of metric, like the Euclidean or Manhattan distance, in order to measure, you know, where things, what set something belongs to. Um, there's many, many books and algorithms on clustering. Um, some of the really popular algorithms that you'll hear all the time is k-means clustering. Um, that relates to another algorithm called EM, and it relates to a particular type of analysis called principal component analysis. Um, Another famous in, a, in a, I don't want to say ancient, but something that was done in like the 70s, is something called hierarchical agglomerative clustering. Um, there's also something called K nearest neighbor that's often used with agglomerative clustering um, for classification purposes. Um, I actually uh, have an implementation of K means that a friend of mine, Tony Pacera, did. Um, and uh, I tried using it, and it was um, it, it didn't work very well, and mostly because I have a very small number of points. But it basically k-means usually does like 100 iterations, and, and it changes the you get something useful back. Um, I basically it did when I ran it, it did two iterations, and getting back what I started with. So <laughs> <laughs> um, you know so. So I decide, like, like whenever um, you know, standard algorithms don't work, I, I, like to, um, I like to think about problems on my own. Um, I once read a book that uh, instructed me in the very beginning not to read the book. Um, it was kind of great. I just put the book down immediately. Um, but <laughs> the idea was that you know, the, the author was telling you you should really, this is literally like his, his quote, you should think about these issues on your own before your mind gets polluted by other people's garbage. So, so um, and it's, it's, kind of, um, it's, it's kind of a true point, you know, it's kind of based on psychology and the primacy effect. You know, it's like, it, once you've like learned something, everything else you learn about that, you're going to compare to that. So if, if the, the first thing that you think about it is your own thoughts, then the knowledge kind of becomes much more your own. Um, some wise dude once said you either have to learn nothing about a subject or everything about it. Yeah, yeah. I had a math professor, I, I asked him once, like, what does it mean to understand mathematics? And he said, when you feel like you invented mathematics on your own, then you understand it. The so, yeah. Algol 68 report was described as, you cannot understand any of it until you've already understood all of it. Yeah, there you go. Um, so I took a big step back and I decided I'm going to invent my own clustering algorithm. So I invented this algorithm and I called it SR clustering because it sounds kind of neat. But the SR actually stands for simple ray clustering. Okay. <laughs> but you know, when you see SR clustering, it looks like you know, some important algorithm, right? <laughs> um, and it's effectively the world's simplest clustering algorithm. <laughs> um, okay, I'm, I was going to talk about k-means, but I have a sense that this has been going on for a while already. Okay, so I'm going to skip k-means. <laughs> um, uh, k-means, k-means. 
Yeah, I know, I know. Ooh, math, right? Yeah. Uh, K means. Okay, I'll skip the hierarchical stuff and we'll get right into simple ray clustering. Okay. It's sort of like non-hierarchical cl um, clustering, uh, but we, we, I didn't talk about that, so forget that. Okay, here's the basic algorithm. Clustering does not get more simpler than this. For each data point, put it in the right cluster. <laughs> okay, now there's this edge case where it doesn't belong to any cluster, right? So if you're an engineer, what you're probably going to do is you're going to force fit it into one of the clusters. But if you're somebody who thinks outside the box like me, you're going to create a new cluster. And, and that's basically how the algorithm works. So the very first pass, um, you know, there's no clusters, so you immediately create a cluster. And you might do that a few times until things start fit, fitting into it. So in order to implement the algorithm, what, I, what you really need is you need to know what, what, what it means to belong to a cluster. What's cluster mem membership? And I define it, in this case, as being within a certain proximity threshold of every data point currently in that cluster. Um, and th that, and then that, that gets into the issue of how do you measure proximity and the proximity metric I'm using is the Jacquard index um, and I'm going to tell you about that. Um, that actually comes from the, the field of recommender systems which is kind of a field of intelligent web applications. It's what Netflix and Amazon and those guys when they say hey why don't you buy this or why don't you watch this movie they're actually using things called user-based recommendations, collaborative filtering and all that. I'm not going to tell you about that. Um, I was but I'm not. Um, but I will tell you about the Jacquard index. It's a really really cool metric because it actually comes from set theory. It doesn't have anything to do with, with any of this probability crap. Um, <laughs> it's basically defined as um, the ratio of the size of the intersection of two sets and the union and the size of the union of two sets. And it's basically a way of measuring set similarity or dissimilarity. Um, it actually works really well in these recommendation systems because these recommendation systems take a look at what people have in common, but they don't take into account the number of things they don't have in common. You know, so like, you know, John and me could read five books and we love those five books, right? So you would think that if I read some other book, John's going to like it. But it turns out we've both read a hundred books and we only like, have five in common that we like. And there's a really good chance that the other 95 we're not going to like, you know, right? You know, so, so this actually captures that. Um, there's a similar uh, notion called the Jacquard distance because usually when you're close to something you want the distance to be small. Um, so it's just one minus the Jacquard index. So in what I'm doing with Wiki, the sets that I'm using are basically the guys you're linked to. Those, those topics that you're linked to. So if you take two Wiki pages, there might be some intersection of pages that they both point to. And that would be kind of the intersection. So you take the number of those, you divide by the, you know, the union, the size of the union, and you have a similarity metric. Um, there's another one that's used a lot called the Pearson correlation coefficient. It's basically the covariance of x and y divided by their, the product of their standard deviation. But we're not going to talk about that. So let's see what happens when we actually apply um, this Jacquard index to some of the topics that we saw in Under the Elephant, right? So here's the African, Asian, Indian, our friends Babar and Horton in war. So Asian and African uh, scored 38, Asian and Babar scored 4, Babar and Horton scored, where's Babar, uh, 28. Um, so you can basically see that things that weren't really related um, were under 10, and things that were related were over 20, um, it's basically. And um, so now let's see what happens when I apply this, I apply simple ray clustering using this metric. Okay. We get seven clusters. And what we have here is Babar, Horton, and Elmer, Asian, African. Um, these are subspecies of elephants, so are these. Dwarf elephant, it turns out, is a prehistoric elephant. Um, <clears throat> war elephant, execution by elephant, crushing by elephant. <laughs> it doesn't all go together, right? <laughs> um, now, uh, year of the elephant um, is another one. The reason these guys are in red is because, strictly speaking, Elephant is not the subject of those noun phrases. Um, they really shouldn't be in this list. Um, execution by elephant is a noun phrase whose, whose, whose uh, subject is execution. Um, it's a statement about execution, a type of execution. It's the not a... Head, What's that? It's head. Right, right. Term, head. head, yes. Yeah, you so... You confuse people. Yeah, I see, yeah. Um, my, um, my simple, you know, extract the subject of the noun phrase is really just taking the last. Um, it, it works with most noun phrases, but it doesn't work with noun phrases that have a prepositional phrase. So that's something I need to improve on. But I left them in here because they, uh, they actually um, illustrated other things that I wanted to show. The other thing I want to mention is that usually in clustering, 
um, when you partition a set into disjoint sets, there's kind of this keyword disjoint, where the same item doesn't appear in more than one set. Um, notice Asian elephant here appears in two sets. And originally I thought that was a bug in my clustering al algorithm. You know, as I was going through the clusters, I forgot to short circuit it and stop as soon as something fits into a cluster. But then I realized that this is actually kind of a feature because it's giving me this, a relationship between the clusters. So as long as it's not um, too much of that, um, just a little bit of that, um, I think is actually kind of a, as you'll see, it's kind of neat. Um, yeah. Why is um, because uh, the because uh, that's a good question. It illustrates the uh, the algorithm. Um, it was very close to War Elephant, like it scored 28, but it wasn't close to these guys. And it, by definition of membership and cluster, you have to be close to each element. Okay. Um, okay. So now that I have these uh, okay, now that I have these nice little clusters here. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to automatically generate better names than cluster 1, cluster 2, cluster 3. I'd like the computer to figure out names for these things. Okay. Um, and, and this is, um, I came up with this idea of knowledge categories. If you think of humans, right, we start the schooling process in kindergarten and we finish it like in potentially like postdoctoral work. That's a really long time. That's like, you know, 20 to 25% of your life you can think of as like this really intense knowledge acquisition process. And, and if you think of it in terms of knowledge acquisition process and you think what are the categories of knowledge and you go back to like way in the beginning when you were in like third grade or something and you had like you know math class, history class, geography class, literature class, whatever. I came up with this small set of, um, of knowledge categories and I just started off with these five. Um, just a very simple set. Uh, science, history, geography, literature and art. And so the idea is to try to take those clusters and put them into one of those categories. And you know, you, you'd imagine that like, you know, Horton and his friends would probably go into literature or art. Um, the war elephant would go into history, and then the subspecies of elephants would go into science, maybe like biology or something, right? Um, so how do you determine um, category applicability or relevance? Again, I'm using the Descart index. Um, I, what I do is I basically crawl these guys a little bit so that I actually have a set of related topics to those guys, and I use that um, to compare them to. And the idea is that once I do that, I can now automatically generate cluster names. I can call them literature elephant, or art elephant, or science elephant, you know, and they're actually meaningful names. Um, uh, okay, so, so I have, um, so I have a little function called compute cluster categories. Um, you know, when you start up a system and initialize things, it crawls the knowledge categories, that's pre-run. You basically compute subtopics of each knowledge category, and we saw how to do that. Then you compute a category re uh, relevancy vector for each cluster member. Then you combine the relevancy vectors of each cluster to compute kind of an average um, relevancy for that cluster. And then you assign a category to a cluster based on the cluster they're more, they're more relevant to. And when I did this, I, um, I ended up with this. So what you're seeing here are basically the two top hits. Okay, so for example, Asian elephant and African elephant came out as science was number one. History was a close runner-up, um, you know, in terms of scores, right? Um, these four guys, as far as I'm concerned, I was happy with. These four guys, I wasn't. Um, uh, Babar and, and Elmer and, and Horton got put into art instead of literature, um, and I'm still trying to understand why. But I guess children's books have a lot of, of drawings and animations in it, so that, that didn't bother me too much, you know. Um, I was very happy that these guys ended up in science. Um, these guys should have ended up in history, in my mind. Um, and it turns out that I'll show you in the next, on the next slide, I'll show you the individual scores for uh, just the, the, the items rather than the clusters. And you'll see that uh, War Elephant actually did fall into the category history. And these guys, Execution by Elephant, Crushing by Elephant, threw it off for some reason. Um, I mean, the other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, these, these categories aren't perfect. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time trying to come up with the ideal set of categories because, you know, it, I, I bet you if I'd had like children's literature or something is one of my categories that that would have been a really good hit for, for Babar and Horton and, and those guys. Um, but, but this is still kind of encouraging. I mean, there's, there's a little bit more work to do. The other thing to, to reinforce uh, the point that you made is that I, I'm not using any content yet. This is all based on the names of the pages, you know. Um, and that's, that's actually kind of, um, kind of neat. Uh, so, Remember I told you that I was allowing Asian elephant to be in more than one category? When I actually ran this the first time, 
this top guy actually ended up in the history category or geography um, and because it only has two guys in it, right? So you don't have a lot to go by. The fact that Asian was in there and in this cluster, whenever there's overlapping uh, members between clusters, I compute their category all at once by combining clusters as one big set. And so these guys had enough weight to, to drag these guys into science. Um, okay. So that was like one way I'm actually leveraging this category overlap. Okay. Um, okay, here's some of the hits on the individual categories. Like Babar scored literature and art. I mean, this is like beautiful. It's perfect. This is exactly what you'd want. Um, uh, Elmer came up as, as art. Um, Horton came up as art too, which is why the category came up as art. I don't have no clue why literature scored so low for Horton. I have no idea. Um, you know, the only thing I can imagine is that, you know, given that I'm only crawling to a certain depth, that perhaps if I crawl to depth four or five or six or something, these things would fall more into place. But it seems really unintuitive that a, a Dr. Seuss book would score so low in the, in the category of literature, you know. Uh, I actually went to the, I actually went to the, yeah, I know, right? Um, I actually went to the literature page, and one of the things that's there is this list of like 20 different subtopics of literature, and they actually put um, computer programs as a type of literature, <laughs> which was really interesting. And then I went to that page, and it listed like the initial, um, these initial computer languages, and Lisp wasn't there, so I added Lisp. It was my, my first effort, my first effort at editing Wiki, and I hadn't logged in, so they, they sent me this big warning saying, we're going to record your IP address, you know, and, <laughs> but I added Lisp and John McCarthy's name, so, okay. yeah, that was uh, my little contribution to Wiki. Um, uh, yeah, and War Elf, and notice War Elf all by itself got put into history, so, um, okay. So what do we end up with when this is done is we end up with, with something that's actually a little bit more organized now um, and conceptually relevant categories. Now, one of the things I mentioned in the beginning is that one of the things I'd love to do is to develop kind of a new type of knowledge browser. And you can imagine that rather than just having this one Google bar, you'd actually have an entry bar and then you have kind of a context you know, we can actually pick different contexts. And you could say search for elephant in the context of literature. Like if you're a third grade school teacher. Or if you're doing in a you know, project in biology, you might want to search on elephant in the context of science. You know, um, so this would basically uh, be a type of like contextually relevant filtering that you could apply to your hits. And if you're looking for elephants in literature, I'm not going to show you any of this other science stuff. You know. Unfortunately, you run up against the incoming power user law. The what? The Inktomi power user law. I don't know what that is. In Inktomi, the definition of power user was somebody who could type more than one term into a search engine. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the problem is that if you search, you, a lot of times your context is not actually going to be embedded in the document you're searching for. You know, um, it's really kind of a different... It's a context, exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Now, now that we got our subtopics nice and organized, remember there was all these other topics from the 228 links that don't have the word elephant in them, right? Um, things like uh, uh, lion and loxodonta and uh, ivory and, and, um, uh, and mammoth and mastodon. So now that I have these clusters and I feel pretty good about them, I can actually leverage that to, again, using the Jacquard index, compare these, these topics to the clusters and see which guys would they really be associated with. And this again gave some pretty good impressive results. I found that I didn't know what a dwarf elephant was, but it turns out the dwarf, a dwarf elephant is a prehistoric elephant. Well, guess what mammoth and mastodons are, right? Like the woolly mammoth. So having it automatically land there is, is pretty darn cool, you know? Um, uh, let's see, what other ones that are interesting? Um, uh, yeah, list of fictional elephants and list of elephants in mythology and religion got put in with, uh, with Babar and Horton and stuff, which is, you know, in terms of what's there, what's available there are kind of reasonable categories. Um, history of elephants in Europe got put into the, you know, the history, um, well, I guess it wasn't history, it was geography, but it should have been history, into the history category. And, um, you know, other animals got put up with the, with the elephants. So, so this, is, this is promising. Um, and again, this is without any looking at the content of the pages. Um, uh, okay. Okay. So that's it for the topic taxonomy. Um, you know, we're, we're wrapping up here. I've got like two or three more slides. The other part of what I want to do is eventually parse the content um, and actually pull out information about the content. 
So here's like an overall view of how you go from an English sentence to some kind of logical clause or causal form logic that you could put in your semantic net. So you start off with an English sentence, you run your scanner on it, you get a set of tokens, you run the, your morphology, your analyzer on it, you produce a set of morphologically analyzed words. Then you run the parser, you produce a parse tree. Then you run a phrase extractor. And what a phrase extractor, you can think of it as kind of like flattening the parse tree and basically just giving you the top level sentence structure. So things like, you know, noun phrase, verb phrase, direct object, indirect object, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, once you have that, you can have a semantic analyzer that basically establishes a frame, which you can think of as a template for a sentence. You know, you want to identify the subject, the verb, the direct object, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, right? And then you can convert this to a clause because now you know, you know, you can use the verb as your predicate and the subject and object as the arguments. And let's see what, so what I'm pulling out right now from the content is very limited because my parser is limited and it's only handling certain types of sentences in English. But um, this is what I was able to pull out from the elephant page. Has a Asian elephant species disjunct distributions. Not really sure what that means. But is the elephants herbivores? And right now I'm just looking for auxiliary verbs. Verbs that contain uh, the verb to be or the verb to have. Okay. Has a African elephants three nails? Has a Indian elephants four nails? Um, has a female African elephants large tusks? And is the elephants large land mammals? Um, and that's actually kind of cool. Um, you know, I'm actually in a point now that I'm actually I can start coming up with little um, kind of uh, rules to put into my knowledge base. You know, I can say if you know, um, elephant X implies mammal X. You know, or elephant X implies large X. You know, stuff like that. Um, you know, if somebody, you know, if you, uh, if you had like some kind of question answering something and then you asked, you know, what's the difference between African, and Asian, and Indian elephants, you know, I could say, well, one of them has three nails, one of them has four nails, right? <laughs> you know, um. Disjunctive so, distributions means that they're allopatric, so you have. They're what? They're allopatric. You have the. You have, I don't know what that means. You have your Indian <laughs> elephants and you have your. Uh, Burmese elephants and you have your Thai elephants and they're different places. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, okay, okay. So, so this is a statement about their geographical distribution, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Um, it also produced a lot of meaningless stuff that I just, I'm not showing you because... <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> well, no, what the meaningless stuff is, is basically um, you're going to see failings of my parser and you're going to see sentence fragments, you know, in these clauses that just don't make that's sense. Yeah, that's right, there you go. <laughs> Computer poetry, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so things I'm not doing yet is, is people have brought up um, I'm not really doing a whole lot with the content yet, but the last slide shows you um, the direction and what I'm going that, and that's that's just a matter of doing more work on the parser and spending a lot of time with Bob. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, that, by the way, Columbia University has a really really good NLP um, department. Um, so, um, yeah. So we. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, this is about the wiki pages. Actually, have a content pane which is kind of like a little table of contents for that page. And that actually does have useful information there. Um, one of the reasons I wasn't specifically using that is that even though right now this whole project is geared around Wikipedia, the goal is to eventually be able to do this to any web page. You know, so I'm really trying to do it at, at an abstract level enough, not making too many assumptions about um, you know, the, uh, the actual web page setup. You know, I'm just assuming that somehow I can get the text out of it. Okay. Um, the other thing I failed to mention is that when I'm building the graph, Every time I visit a node, because you know, as you follow links, you keep coming back to the same node, um, I actually bump the weight on that node. So concepts actually have a sense of importance. Um, and one thing I'm not doing is taking into account that importance. You probably saw a few slides where um, uh, there were numbers here after concept. These are actual list of objects. You know, African elephant 60. You know, these, this is actually the weight on, the, on the, the number of times that node was visited. It actually corresponds to the number of inbound links to that page is what those numbers really mean. Um, uh, future direction, uh, clearly enhance English parser, incorporate variables into semantic net, leverage topic weights, work on language generation. You know, one thing I'd like to be able to do is if I can kind of extract all this stuff from lots of different pages is to combine like a whole topic taxonomy into a single page of a summary page, you know. Um, knowledge queries, there's a, a lot of AI programs that were written that, uh, there were a lot of them were, were written originally for um, children's books to try to understand children's books and then ask questions, you know, who is Horton, where does Horton live, you know, you know how many seeds did, did, uh, did Jack's mother give him and stuff like that. You know. um, 
Uh, and then the ultimate goal here is to develop a, a client-side browser. And what I'm thinking originally, what this is going to look like is, it's going to kind of look like Internet, ex um, it's kind of look like a, a file directory browser where on the, on the left you have a tree. Um, this would be a tree of topics. On the right you have a content. And the topics would basically be wiki pages and you can kind of navigate through them. So it would be kind of a, a niftier way of navigating wiki based on, on relevant things. And at the very top would be kind of this list of, uh, of, um, of knowledge categories. And if you're actually, a, if this is actually a, a user-based thing, they don't have to be knowledge categories. They could be user interests. You know, there was a point in my life where, I mean, there were four things I was interested in. I was interested in artificial intelligence, reptiles, the Grateful Dead, and playing Frisbee. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what I was interested in. And, and that, those might have been my four categories there. And then you might have an, everything else, you know. You might have left out one or two. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but th those are subtopics. <laughs> um, okay, so um, what's next here? References, yes. Okay, so I mentioned Jurafsky and Martin. Um, Artificial Intelligence, Pete uh, Russell Norvig is a great book. Uh, Principles of Semantic Networks, a lot of the stuff I talked about semantic networks is actually from that book. Um, it's a collection of articles um, edited by so SOA. The first article is actually the one that really kind of lays out the grounds for, um, for what semantic nets are and it's written by someone called Bill Woods and he was actually Peter Norvig's boss at Sun East like 15 years ago, so or 20 years ago. Um, Machine Learning by Tom Mitchell is a really, really good book. Um, it, it used to be considered kind of the de facto textbook for an in, a graduate introductory course in machine learning. Um, it covers like 13 or 14 different machine learning approaches. Um, unfortunately, books on data mining and stuff really kind of very limited focus in terms of a, there's a lot of algorithms they don't tell you about. Um, Pattern Classification and Scene Analysis, Duda and Hart, um, is a great book for clustering. It used to be the standard. Um, uh, and then this other book I read because uh, this was like I was, I was going to get this job with this group in Chicago and it had to do with building recommendation systems. So I decided to read up on recommender systems. It's actually where I got the idea for the Jacquard Index. Um, it's a book called Algorithms, the Intelligent Web by uh, Manis and Babenko. Um, basically has three sections, recommender systems, clustering, and classification. Um, okay, now you see all this stuff we did with text? I'd like to do this with images too. And check it out. Um, I went to the wiki pages, and each one of them actually has an, uh, an image for that topic, right? So here's African elephant, here's Babar, here's Horton, here's Elmer, and here's War Elephant. And if you actually think of it as humans doing the clustering, I mean, I think most people would put this aside as being a separate cluster. Um, I think you'd group these two together. Um, this one, you know, you might group with this one or not, but you can kind of see how we would do the clustering even at the image level, you know. Oops. So that's, that's a ways down the road. But that's something I want to talk to Bob about because Bob has this really, really cool website called uh, Wordseye. Yeah, where basically you type in a sentence in English and up pop, pops an image of that. Um, it's really impressive. And yeah, he's... Oh, uh, uh, really? But how do, you, how do you know how to draw things? Is it just like one... Right, but what I want to do is build some kind of like stick figure language where I could actually recognize that there's elephants in all three of these pictures. You know, um... <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah, Elmer's going to be challenged. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, you know, and yet, you know, what's funny, John, is that we look at these and we immediately recognize it, right? So, you know, if you can characterize an elephant by big ears and a trunk, you know, that's, that might be all it is, you know? I mean, if you think of what meaning is and understanding, I mean, meaning is really just the perception of contrast um, at some level, you know, so. Anyway, this was up for fun. Ah, then the other thing I want to say is that um, this, the, my final clause is love elephants, lisp NYC. Um, as you can see, these two elephants are making parens with their, with their uh, trunks. <laughs> with a little heart in the middle there. Okay, so in the spirit of, uh, of John McCarthy, you know, elephants love lisp NYC. Um, and I guess that's all I have. So questions? Yeah. Well, why was thinking about when you said that one of the elephant types was in more than one cluster? Yeah. I think the reason why Yeah. The more likely a specific topic more than one. Yeah. I think that's the reason. Okay. I'm not actually using K-means. Um, I'm using, um, but, but your point is, is well taken. I'm actually using uh, this that little simple algorithm that I, that I did um, where I'm allowing, uh, I'm just not, I'm allowing things to be in more than one cluster. 
Wait, but you're absolutely right um, about k-means because especially if the clusters are really close together. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Um, so I wrote down a whole bunch of things, but um, I have two kind of questions. Okay. Um, has Google talked to you? Because I was at Google Pittsburgh about two weeks ago, and they said that you know in the beginning they used to index and search pages, but now they're moving to indexing and searching and categorizing entities. Define entity. Mm. Well, concepts. Uh, concepts. Okay. Okay. That's no, fine. And, and it, it, they're 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 making something semantic. Which yes. sounds very related to what you're I know, saying. I know. It's so actually they have to talk to you, they should talk to yes, you. Yes, no, it's actually very disconcerting because I read a press release um, from Google um, promoting something called knowledge graphs. And I can only imagine right. that they're doing something similar to what I'm doing. Right. Um, which, you know but I you was know, hoping to sell them the idea. Talk. Yeah, I was hoping to sell them the, the idea. Other, you know? The other thing is that <laughs> DARPA's you said something about generating summaries. Yes. And I know that that's something DARPA's interested in huh. very mm. much. Okay. Yeah. I know that DARPA's interested in automatic um, Taxonomy generation. They actually uh, tried to contract out to Franz um, to do stuff like that. Well, the, the summary generation, you, know, I mean, you can imagine their intelligence agencies just trying to make sense of the huge amount of information they're having problems with that. Yeah. Hmm. You good? Yeah. No? Wait, wait, okay, I guess so. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for bringing many more questions at McKenna's Pub. Can I get five minutes before?